Well, thank you all for joining. Uh, I know there's still some folks rolling in, um, but uh, welcome to the, the third uh, Cleaner Air Partnership Luncheon of 2021. Brittany, if you wouldn't mind taking the, the slide down so we can all see one another, that would be uh, awesome. So thanks for doing that. Um, my name is Adrian Wren. I'm a project leader with Valley Vision and I'm staffed to uh, the Sacramento Region's Cleaner Air Partnership Coalition. Um, we're really pleased to see so much interest in the intersection of climate change and air quality. These are two deeply related issues which all too often feel siloed and separate from one another. Um, as we emerge from a global pandemic with many links to air quality issues, we at CAP very much appreciate the continued support and interest uh, in important topics like this. So to better understand who's in today's meeting, please enter your name and your affiliation in the chat box. Uh, at the bottom of your screen. So this is how we'll introduce one, one another. Um, so you can do that now. And while you're doing that, um, I can give a little bit of background on the Clean Air Partnership for folks who might be new. Uh, so CAP, as we call it, was formed all the way back in 1986 by the Sacramento Metro Chamber and Breathe California Sacramento Region. Uh, Valley Vision began to manage it about 15 years ago. It's currently a broad-based partnership, including business leaders, environmental advocates, public health nonprofits, and our region's five air quality management districts who are all working together to help the six county Sacramento region protect public health and promote economic growth by advocating for cleaner air. Uh, a big thank you to our event sponsors, many of you on the call today, um, the SAC Metro Air District, Tykert, SMUD, Sutter Health, Union Pacific, the Sacramento Association of Realtors, the Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District, El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, North State BIA, PG&E, and the Healthy Air Alliance. Thank you all. Um, little bit of housekeeping before diving in. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and a link will be shared with you all early next week. Reminder that you can always find recordings of Valley Vision hosted events on our YouTube channel, uh, as noted earlier. And as you've likely noticed, this is a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar in order to be a little bit more interactive. Um, so if you have questions you'd like to verbalize, please use the raise hand function. Um, the raise hand function can be accessed, depending on your version of Zoom, it's either under the participants button or the reactions button. So one of those two. Um, those using the Zoom app on iPhone or Android also have the option. Uh, those calling in should dial star nine to raise or lower their hand and star six to mute or unmute. There's also a chat box uh, you guys can have side conversations um, or you can ask questions, which I will try to elevate uh, from the chat, but please do try to try to raise your hand when possible. Um, so now I'd like to introduce my, my Valley Vision colleague, Brittany Johnson. Um, she's here with us, uh, a Valley Vision executive associate supporting our CEO, Evan Schmidt. And she also works on projects in our leadership and civic engagement impact area. Um, Brittany is gonna be running the back end of this operation so that all goes smoothly. Uh, and she'll also be tracking hand raises. Brittany, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany. <laughs> As he said, um, I um, assist Evan Schmidt and also Trish Kelly and along with some other staff administratively. Um, and I'm on here to help you guys out today. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much, Brittany. We, we love Brittany. Um, so next up, we're gonna be doing a fun Zoom poll as a little bit of an icebreaker. This is something I, I, I like to do for our virtual events. Um, this has been a, a topic of, uh, a controversial topic in the Valley Vision office. Um, I'm launching it now. So the, the, the poll is pumpkin spice, yes or no? And, I, and I'm seeing the results come in. Uh, I know highly controversial subject, um, but, but it, it's the season to be, to be having these, these, converse, these important conversations. And, and no, we are not doing market research for Starbucks. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, and share the results. It's a close one, <laughs> but the no's have it. Um, <laughs> anybody, th th thank you so much for participating. Uh, I'm personally not a big pumpkin spice fan, but um, you know, a lot of folks are. All right, so now let's, uh, let's dive into our, our subject matter for today, um, the intersection of local air quality and climate change and how we can take collective action on both concurrently. So we, we really hope that today's event feels like a discussion between everyone on the call. We have three experts with varied perspectives who look forward to exploring this topic and answering all your questions. 
So um, after a brief introduction and context setting from each of our guests, we will reserve most of our time for open discussion. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, hand it off to our first speaker. And Brittany, if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, her slides. Um, Rajinder Sahota, Deputy Executive Officer for Climate Change and Research at the California Air Resources Board. You are up, please take it away. Great, thanks, Adrian. I'm just waiting for the slides to show up, um, but really appreciate the opportunity by the Cleaner Air Partnership and Valley Vision to actually be here and have this conversation with all of you. There's a couple of slides in here that are going to be directly related to local action that I think will be really, really important um, to share some of it related to conversations that are active with legislative members and discussions with the business industry and some of the cities that we're looking to partner with. So with that, um, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Um, it's good to know what our trends have looked like for greenhouse gases. And what you see there is the chart that shows how GWP has grown. This is only through 2019, so it does not reflect the pandemic. The growth in population, our overall GHG emissions, GHG emissions per capita, and GHG emissions per GDP. And what we see is that we've continued to make progress on emissions and those metrics, even while the GDP and the population grew in the state, which is a good story. The economy is getting less carbon intensive and we are reducing our footprint as individuals. Um, it's also important to understand what are the sources of emissions for the state of California. And what we see there is transportation is the largest source, it's 41%. That is only tailpipe emissions. That does not count the emissions associated with oil and gas extraction and refining. Oil and gas extraction and refining are half of the industrial sector. It's about 12%. So when you add tailpipe with the supply side for fuels, you're looking at over 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state of California coming from uh, the transportation sector. Uh, and then of course the, the next sectors are all including their uh, electricity. We are a big importer of power, so we have a significant amount of emissions associated with imports relative to in-state generation. Uh, some agriculture, which is really dairy and um, fertilizer emissions, commercial, which is the energy that goes towards our commercial buildings and the residential natural gas use and, and residential stocks throughout the state. Next slide, please. I do wanna focus a little bit on the transportation sector. It is not only our largest source of GHG emissions, it's also the largest source of NOx emissions and PM2.5 emissions. So what you see on the two pie graphs on the right hand side are the contributions from mobile sources, on-road, mobile trucks and buses and cars in terms of the NOx emissions for the state. And then um, on the far right is the PM2.5 emissions. And this gets to the air quality piece. So what we have here is, a, is, is conclusive data that addressing the transportation sector will not only help us get to the climate goals that we need to achieve, but also really help on the local harmful air pollution piece that we're all trying to accomplish. Next slide, please. And um, one of the things that we are working on at ARB is the AB32 climate change scoping plan. Uh, these plans are required in AB32 and they are actionable plans to ensure that we meet statewide GHG emission reduction targets. The first one was done in 2008 to lay out a path to achieve the 2020 target, which we did in 2016, so four years earlier than mandated. Um, and every scoping plan has relied on a suite of climate policies to address emissions across all sectors. So there's no single policy. We look at everything from uh, electricity sector policies, transportation, whether it's land use, uh, decisions, planning, fuels and technology, all the way to uh, oil and gas regulations, landfill regulations and dairy regulations for fugitive methane. Um, and the last scoping plan we did was in 2017 and it laid out a cost effective and technologically feasible path to achieve our 2030 target. So our 2030 target was to reduce to 40% below 1990 levels, um, no later than 2030. Uh, the scoping plan is required to be up updated at least once every five years. And we just kicked off the process to update that scoping plan earlier this summer. So we're actively working on the version of the plan that will go to our board at the end of 2022. It will assess progress towards achieving the 2030 target. And it will also lay out a path to achieving carbon neutrality no later than 2045. Each plan is designed to provide direct GHG emissions reductions and air quality benefits. 
Um, if any of you are familiar with the plan, you will see that it leverages many of the air quality programs to meet our state implementation targets for the federal level as part of the process to get the GHG emission reductions, because in reducing harmful air pollution, there is some overlap that also achieves GHG emission reductions. We are directed to minimize leakage, which is that we should work to make sure that production doesn't leave the state of California, which would look like a reduction in GHG emissions for us on our books, but really from the perspective of the atmosphere, we just moved that production and associated emissions outside of our accounting boundary. Um, and then of course, with the production leaving the state, you also lose jobs and economic activity for the state. Uh, there's direction in AB 32 to make sure we facilitate subnational and national collaboration. And so we work with other states when it comes to our waiver authority. We work with um, some national governments when it comes to some of our climate programs like the low carbon fuel standard and our cap and trade program. And another key piece of it was to make sure that we support cost effective compliance for the entities that are regulated under the policies that are included in the plan. Next slide, please. So climate action plans, these are the plans that you are probably most familiar with. Um, you know, this is really the place where the California cities and counties demonstrate uh, their leadership in addressing climate change. Um, they are not required in California, but various state laws incentivize their use. And ideally, CAPS bolster actions identified in the AB 32 climate change scoping plan. And so in every scoping plan, we do identify a section on local action, where local action can be critical to ensuring success of the state level policies, but local action that is outside of our purview can also further um, increase the rate of reductions of GHGs across the state towards, our, towards those same targets. Next slide, please. I do wanna go through each of these a little bit because they do have some role for local agencies. Um, doubling building efficiency, this is where reach codes can be really important. So doubling building efficiency is called for under SB 350. It's under the purview of the Public Utilities Commission, Energy Commission, and to some extent CARB, the agency I work for. And so the REACH codes really can help on achieving that target. Um, more clean renewable fuels. This is really about uh, making sure that we're, we're transforming our, our fuel pool from fossil-based fuels to um, zero carbon renewable fuels. And this can include everything from electrification of transportation and even using existing assets like refineries and repurposing them to produce renewable fuels in the state. Um, obviously, any infrastructure that has to be built or any repurposing that requires changing in, in the configuration of facilities will require permits at the local level. We have two refineries sitting out in San Francisco right now that are trying to get through the permit process to be able to produce sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel, which provides uh, immediate uh, in, uh, improvements in local air quality. The, the concern there is that local groups are not very keen to keep those facilities in any form or fashion in the region, but they have an opportunity to produce economic activity and the energy that we're gonna need for the future. There's also cleaner zero, near, zero emission cars, trucks, and buses. This again goes to infrastructure and public fleets. Um, and then we've got land use planning, which goes to the walkable, bikeable communities with transit. Uh, renewable power, we are seeing that we need to cite more renewable power in the state. Um, and if we don't cite it in the state, we need to have it uh, cited somewhere so that we can import it. But if we're going to import it in, we're going to need some transmission build out. Again, that gets to permitting. Um, we also have super pollutants from dairies, landfills, and refrigerants. As we think about diverting organics from landfills, we need a place to put them. Um, so we're looking at permits required to expand existing wastewater facilities to take that uh, material or building compost facilities, which also require local permits. Um, and then invest in communities to reduce emissions. This is really coming back to um, some of the money that's generated in the cap and trade program, which then is provided back into, into communities to help on equity issues, access to clean technology and clean fuels, um, and other things that can help address um, harmful air pollution, but also bring clean options into uh, residences that maybe could not afford them without that, without those rebate programs and other programs. And then again, protect and manage natural working lands. This goes back to local land use planning decisions as well, and really about looking at our natural working lands as a sink for emissions at the state level, 
um, not just a recreational place, but more importantly, that they have a place, a role to play in climate mitigation. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that we had in an oversight hearing for the legislature, Chair Randolph used it. And so we were talking through the scoping plan implementation. You know, we've had governors, the legislature, Californians clearly poll after poll wanting to have action to address climate change. We've had policy signals going back almost two decades to attract private investment in clean technology. And the issues that we're coming into at the state level, whether we're hearing it through GoBiz, the governor's office or other state agencies, is issues related to permitting and opposition at the local level by local grassroots organizations. And I think the challenge here is that, you know, everybody thinks to achieve uh, our climate targets and make sure that we're addressing harmful air pollution, it's to just turn things off in our regions. But what we're really trying to do is transition some of the existing infrastructure and build out infrastructure for the new needs that we have. And so it just can't be taking things off the table. We actually have to either repurpose things or add new, um, new facilities, new infrastructure for where we need to go long-term for climate and, and air pollution. Next slide, please. Uh, the target that we're working on right now past 2030 is how to achieve carbon neutrality. And I wanted to make sure that we provided our current working definition to all of you so you know what we're talking about in the scoping plan. And that's really when sources equal sinks. To, to date, we focused on the sources in our AB32 GHG inventory process, which is transportation, fossil fuel production, industry, energy generation. We have a separate inventory for natural and working lands. And then when we think about sinks, we have carbon capture and sequestration, direct air capture, and opportunities in the natural and working lands. Um, obviously, for those sinks like CCS, direct air capture, um, those are going to, if we're building those out, that go, again goes back to local permitting decisions uh, and local grassroots organizations and how they feel about it. And then on natural working lands, it's preserving and enhancing management of those to make sure that they can be part of the solution and not just a, a source of emissions. Um, and the goal ultimately is to go net negative. There was legislation that was working its way through the, through the process that would have said to be net negative no later than 2045. There are other issues with the bill that didn't make it make it um, across the, the finish line, but we expect continued uh, efforts to have legislation that would enshrine the carbon neutrality target and all of these options as being able to be part of the solution um, at, in next year's, next year's session or shortly after. But the continued focus on reductions in the AB32 GHG inventory sources is important just because we have options for sinks, we just can't focus on the sinks. We need to continue to reduce emissions from the, the fossil and industrial side because that is really going to drive down emissions for harmful air pollution and really address the equity issues where many of these large sources are located um, adjacent to disadvantaged communities throughout the state. Next slide, please. So some of the key considerations that I will leave us with is that the scoping plans are the actual blueprint for achieving the state's statutory climate targets. Um, they are going to rely on successful implementation at all levels of government. And here I want to flag that even though we hit the 2020 target four years earlier than mandated, we were able to achieve a lot of emission reductions upstream in the source of energy that comes into the economy. When we think about 2030, which is that 40% reduction and then carbon neutrality, we actually need to build new infrastructure and we need to use or repurpose existing assets. And so we need to make sure that those are available. We can't just rely on a mix of energy coming into the system at the very highest levels of the economy. We need to actually produce some of that energy as well. Um, and then we should consider how CAPS um, will accommodate that. And if they accommodate that, to make sure that it's not just a drive to zero, but a recognition that we actually need to keep some of these sources around to hit the larger goals. There will need to be substantial investment in this decade to be successful in achieving carbon neutrality by 2045 and unprecedented um, investment. And what we've been talking to the legislature about is that huge investment that we need in this decade will pay off. It just doesn't pay off in the next 10 years. It pays off in the next two decades to three to four decades and that you avoid the worst impacts of climate change and you avoid the cost for those higher damages associated with, that, with climate change. Uh, and importantly, you know, government does not have the funds alone to support the transition. And so our policies and the way that we implement them need to attract private investment, 
that will keep jobs, it will keep an economic and tax base in the state, um, and that makes the plans exportable, and th that becomes a role model for other jurisdictions. If we don't have something that looks like it's attractive and exportable, we lose, we all lose, because California alone cannot achieve um, what needs to happen on a global level to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Next slide, please. And that's the end of my presentation and just a few links to some of the materials that um, we've posted recently. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rajinder. And there was one question before we go to Michael. You had a slide with uh, showing PM 2.5 emissions. Was that uh, tailpipe or roadware or both? Uh, can we go back to the slide? I'm pretty sure it was tailpipe. Okay, Brittany, you wanna bring that, that up if possible? It's okay, I, I think I remember. I think it was tailpipe. Okay, just tailpipe. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right, Brittany, you're good. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about like, that. No, you're, you're, you're good. Um, Susan, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, my question is about uh, agriculture dust. And there's uh, the valley fever and such that has been created from the way that uh, corporate ag has been done. And there's a big push now globally to go to what's called regenerative uh, agriculture. Uh, for California, it would be good to uh, work with these big corporate ag people and see if they couldn't take a year to just not till their land and, and put it back in because California is at risk of a dust bowl. And I also um, <clears throat> think that this is very part of the uh, protecting natural and working lands because the kinds of um, corporate ways of working with the land, of putting synthetic uh, oil-based, by the way, fertilizers and stuff to make the plants grow, it's not the healthiest food that you can grow actually, but all that stuff is going into the water and the air. And I think it's a big, um, issue that would be a real transforming. Oh, the other thing is that regenerative ag has been shown to be an incredible drawdown of carbon. So this is, to me, one of the primary things that could be done in a transformative way to help our air quality. Well, thanks for that, Susan. Um, I don't know if, Regina, you want to respond, but uh, Susan, I'd encourage you to share some resources in the chat if possible. Regina? Yeah, I will just say that what I didn't mention here is accompanying the scoping plan and feeding into it as part of the as part of the natural working lands executive order that the governor um, signed. I think it was earlier this year or even late last year. There's a whole climate smart strategy that's being formulated to look at these issues about how our natural working lands, including agricultural land, can be managed to make sure that we're enhancing the sequestration and reducing the amount of emissions off of it. And so the regenerative farming, I know, is part of that conversation. Pesticides have come up. I will say that pesticides do not have a huge GHG impact, but they are part of the, the worker safety and they are part of um, other efforts at sister agencies like, the, like DPR, the Department of Pesticide Regulation. And so we are coordinating with them on um, helping to address questions related to the scoping plan, which is focused on greenhouse gases and how, what intersection there is there with pesticides and other hooks for getting at that piece of it. Thanks for that. So we have a couple hand raises. Let's, let's leave it at these so that we can uh, uh, get on with our presentations and then have an, a more open discussion. But we have John Lane and then uh, Dr. Ayala. John, you wanna go? Sure, uh, John Lane with Tykert. Um, thanks for the presentation. A, a question I had was relative to the uh, relative contributions of the greenhouse gases, you had shown a figure that essentially had arrows that included transportation industry and others, and you mentioned working lands and wildfire. Well, I remember at the Clean Air Partnership a few years ago, we were talking about the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions from wildfires, and we saw graphs then, but the, the contribution trends for transportation and industry are all following fairly straightforward trends, but wildfire, we've, as we've all seen, is dr increasing dramatically. What's the relative contribution with now? And we're, last year, we burned 4 million acres. We're at 2 million now and about to, you know, we could potentially see 4 million this year. What's the relative contribution of wildfires now compared to the rest of those? And how do we address that, what is probably a very rapidly increasing trend line? 
Yeah, and so I think this goes back to what previous legislation has required us to account for in terms of the statewide targets. So it's always been focused on the industrial energy and transportation side, but we've always also, due to a different piece of legislation, kept a natural working lands inventory. And as part of that, we do have a wildfire inventory. So I remember our latest one was being published. I think the wildfires contributed almost 100 million metric tons to emissions, but those are separate from the 2020 target and the 2030 target. But with the, with the new framework of carbon neutrality, it doesn't say just focus on the transportation and industrial side. It says to look at all sources and sinks when you think about GHGs in the atmosphere, because regardless of where they come from, they behave the same and they have the same outcome. And that's why the governor signed the Natural Working Lands Executive Order to have a focus on how do you manage the lands and how do you manage um, resources to make sure that you're reducing the load that goes into wildfires, but also on a continuous basis, managing the, the, taking, and care, the taking care of those resources to make sure that you don't have these big catastrophic releases of carbon when you have a massive wildfire. What's, what's happened, unfortunately, due to our no burn policies for protecting homes and life is we've had an accumulation of material that's sitting there. And with climate change exacerbating drought, and heat waves, et cetera, it's now all coming up in one massive um, load of emissions into the atmosphere when those wildfires happen. Yeah, that was just my question was, is at this point, is it the majority of greenhouse gas emissions when we're burning 4 million to, you know, acres a year? It's not the majority. Thank you for that question. Uh, Alberto. Thank you, uh, Adrian. Thanks, uh, Rajinder. Good to see you. Um, my question is about what comes after 2030. Um, as you know, with the uh, importance of environmental justice and equity, um, cap and trade from day one has been a flashpoint with the environmental justice community. Um, arguably, it's not the most efficient way to get to carbon reduction. So should we expect uh, ARB to continue to promote uh, cap and trade beyond 2030 to get to the 2050 target? Can you comment on, on that? So I can, I can comment on part of that. Um, we know that there's been um, a lot of pushback against cap and trade by environmental justice community groups. Um, and many of the studies that they've cited to as being evidence of that, the authors have recently come out and said there is no demonstrated link between cap and trade causing harmful air, air pollution in communities. Um, and further conversations with the advocates it's a philosophical disagreement. They would prefer something more prescriptive on sources instead of something that they like, because if industry likes it, there's this um, fear that there must be some kind of loophole that they can exploit and not actually deliver the reductions they need to deliver. And so it's, it's more of a philosophical disagreement and less of a fact-based dis disagreement on whether or not cap and trade should be part of the solution. And cap and trade has actually delivered reductions um, in, in sectors that we've seen. And more importantly, it has raised billions of dollars over which 50% have been invested back into communities um, and into the AB 617 programs to help with the equity issues, um, where if the legislature had thought it was a priority, they could have found another funding source before cap, tapping cap and trade for that. Um, carbon pricing is gonna continue to be part of the, the plans that we're gonna put forward as the staff. Um, there is still a strong desire to have carbon pricing paired with incentives, paired with regulations in every scoping plan. The legislature and two administrations have debated what form the carbon pricing should be. Should it be a carbon tax or a cap and trade program? Two separate times over two decades, they've chosen cap and trade both times. And so there is strong political commitment to the program. There is a funding source that feeds into some of the programs that are critical for addressing equity. It's going to continue to be part of the conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much for that response. There are a couple of other really good questions in the chat that I think are actually well positioned for uh, later in, in, our, in our meeting um, when all of the, the uh, speakers can respond to them. So I'm going to hold them, promise. Uh, and then I, I want to invite uh, Michael McCormick to, um, so thank you, Rajinder, <laughs> uh, so you stay on. Um, Michael McCormick, um, who is president and founder of Farallon Strategies. Um, Brittany, if you're able to bring up Perfect. Bring up uh, Michael's slides. Um, I'd love to hand it over to you to speak from a more of a local government perspective about um, climate action plans and how everything ties into the local air quality work we're all doing. So take it away, Michael. 
and I think you're on mute. And Brittany, I, I also don't see his slides. You might want to try try again with the screen share. Yeah, still not hearing you, Michael. But now I see your slides. <laughs> All right, here we go. There we go. Now can you hear me? All right. So yeah, so I have some challenging issues with bandwidth. I tried to call in. Clearly, that didn't work. So here we are. So nice to see everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, from the perspective of local government, a little bit of my background and why I can do that is uh, I've spent about 20 years working on climate change and I've written a couple dozen climate action plans. I also spent about eight years at OPR where I co-authored the general plan guidelines, worked with Regender and the ARB staff as well on a couple of uh, scoping plans um, and have been uh, actively engaged. I actually pivoted when I left OPR back to the local level because I really was seeing a lack of progress on implementation of policy. So my focus in, in my work is really trying to connect and activate communities and organizations to really do the work of implementation. So that's kind of my perspective coming into this. So you'll get a little bit of angle of that as I go through some of my slides. And of course, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> my background is from OPR, so I love to use OPR resources. So this is the OPR Annual Planning Survey which is a really helpful resource if you haven't looked at this or, or accessed this in the past. I've got a link to it at the bottom at the, uh, the end of this presentation as well. So, you know, 2020, wow, a unique period in time, COVID, multiple mandates kicking in on housing, environmental justice, climate adaptation. Um, and when we look at the staff capacity in counties, uh, there's counties and cities included in here. I just took a couple of snapshots to kind of make a point, but you know, from full capacity on the left, where there's no consultants needed to the right, where there's no staff and no funding. As you can see, some of our key priorities in the state around climate, environmental justice, equity, they just can't be met with existing capacity. So if you go to the next slide, one way to address the capacity and kind of move forward collectively uh, on things is through collaboration. We see a fair amount of collaboration on housing at the city level, but much less on the priorities we're talking about today. So if you go to the next slide, um, you know, there isn't really a direct comparison between city and county, but um, with city alignment to regional initiatives, when we compare county alignment at the regional scale of planning topics, topics as well, shockingly, you see that the areas where there's the most regional collaboration is where there's the most regional alignment, um, uh, not surprisingly. So again, take a look at the environmental justice, health and racial equity fits here look at regional collaboration, a lack of regional alignment. I'd argue that there's a fair amount of work happening to align work across the region, but uh, that alignment actually hasn't really happened yet. The work's taking place now. We're kind of on that threshold of, uh, you know, between progress and success. So next slide. So on the climate side of things, um, we do see a lot of progress in certain measures being implemented across cities and counties solar, electric vehicle primarily, which has really had strong support from the state and federal government in many ways, as has mandates across addressing greenhouse gas emissions through climate action planning and CEQA, and in general plans as an extension of that CEQA mandate. But when it comes to no regret strategies to actually reduce emissions, not just plan for it, we see less than 20% of jurisdictions have implemented, for example, green building codes, fleet conversions, carbon neutrality ambition, ambitions, distributed energy ordinances, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of space for progress. We're, uh, we're not making the progress we could be. So um, if you go to the next slide, we do see a lot of interest in alignment across, for example, climate and environmental justice. SB 379, which requires adaptation be addressed in general plans and SB 1000, which requires environmental justice be addressed uh, in disadvantaged communities, um, generally about half, or if you could go back one slide, generally about half of jurisdictions in the state that have to do these updates have not done these yet. So the, the, the due dates for these are, the last due date to, to do the safety element updates on adaptation is January of 2022. So we're bumping into some um, pretty significant uh, issues on statutory mandates and timelines, um, but also huge opportunities to create alignment right now because there's so many of these things moving forward concurrently. 
So what does this tell, tell us? And you can leave the slide up for, uh, I don't have more slides on this, but a few points to be made. So what does it tell us? Um, the thing we're finding, and you know, this kind of tells us the same thing we're finding on the ground. There's a lack of capacity, a lack of funding to plan for and implement climate, resilience, environmental justice, and equity policies. That since planning is required, but implementation may not be tracked as closely, that the perpetual planning paralysis is real. For those of you the planners, you know this thing is real. Those of us working on climate action plans who've reanalyzed climate action plans over and over again and have not seen the implementation, I know this is real. Um, we know that when people collaborate to align objectives and jointly implement priorities, progress is made faster. We also know that when initiatives get funded at the local level, things get built, things get done, uh, programs get implemented. So when we've learned from the last decade plus in the practice of climate action planning is that you have to fund implementation to get things implemented, not just planning. And the legislature has recognized that this year with putting a, a very significant amount of money into the implementation side uh, of the work on climate. So we have to collaborate inside a jurisdiction and with jurisdictions uh, across a region to scale quickly. And um, for those of, those of us working in the local level, sometimes it's harder to co collaborate and coordinate inside a jurisdiction than it is with, to collaborate with other jurisdictions because of those uh, quote unquote silos of excellence that we like to see uh, in our own uh, organizations. So we've learned a lot. The ambition needs to address climate change, uh, you know, really exceeds the capacity of local governments to do that work using our current model of go to loan policies. All right, so when folks say we have 10 years left to really get going on climate, um, and this is the common narrative, uh, what that means is that we need to get policies implemented right now. We need to start implementing them right now to achieve our reductions by 2030 and 2040. There's Ginger's point of, you know, we need to make progress really quickly in order to hit some of these targets. Um, the land use patterns, for example, uh, and I know this, you know, she went over this a bit, but you know, local control over land use is a really important aspect of local, aspect of local planning. Those patterns don't correct in a few years. It's multi-decadal uh, issues we're trying to solve very quickly, faster than we've tried to solve almost anything else before, maybe outside of housing. So and with the compounding effects of extreme events linked to climate, addressing climate refugees, not being maladaptive, so doing things that are exacerbating the issues that we're already uh, trying to solve, all through the lens of equity and justice. You know, since we've rushed in the past, it often has been impacting uh, things that we've tried to do really quickly have impacted uh, traditionally marginalized communities and peoples. So there's a few things that um, we need to do, and this isn't a surprise to all, most of you who've been in the space for a long time, but okay, we need to decarbonize the grid, transfer almost everything that emits emissions to something that plugs in uh, via liquid or gas fuels, reduce demand on the grid as much as possible through efficiency, time of use, uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled, et cetera but also ensuring enough capacity, stability, and a resilience on the grid to manage variations in demand, avoiding maladaption, and concurrently addressing climate impacts, and doing this all through the equity and environmental justice lens seems really easy, right? <laughs> right, so we've talked about this over the years, and um, what we found is that this does not work at the local level. This, this works if we collaborate and coordinate across multiple jurisdictions at the regional scale. Um, and it requires a, a, a new way of thinking about how we work together across communities to make progress. We have this opportunity. We have historic funding from both state and federal resources. So we should be acting now on no regret strategies, not waiting for a plan. And I say this as a planner, not waiting for a plan to implement things that'll clearly be included in that plan. We know what many of the most uh, effective measures are to reduce emissions. We should be working on them now. And when I was at OPR, we had this philosophical conversation about uh, targets, local targets for greenhouse gas emissions. And, um, you know, getting to zero is actually easier from a numeric standpoint than trying to select some arbitrary numeric target. So aiming for zero means there has to be real commitment, real resources. As Biden used to say when he was uh, in, in Congress, uh, you know, show me your budget and then I'll show you what your priorities are. Well, so there's no time to wait. We're, we need all hands on deck, civil society, government, um, community groups, uh, business all working together. 
Um, and it's happening in this region. We're starting to see it, but it's not, it's not connecting as well as it could be. Um, you know, we have deep decarbonization alignment in many ways across this region. I'm working with Yolo County, for example, right now, and uh, helping them to create a process to get carbon neutral by 2030. And that's a huge lift, particularly for uh, agricultural uh, county, uh, primarily that is, um, has strong growth management uh, measures already in place. You can't build your way out to carbon neutrality. Uh, and they're not gonna be successful without strong partnerships across, uh, across the region, cities inside the county, but also collaboration and coordination with other communities across the region. And small things cascade too. So this isn't negating the fact that the day-to-day -day changes that we make in operations are super impactful. We found that those communities that put the question on, a, on uh, staff reports for city councils and board of supervisors, for example, you know, there's always the question of uh, how does this impact our budgets at the, at the board or council level? Well, those that include the question of how does this impact our goals around climate? How does this impact our goals around equity and environmental justice? Those issues move forward more effectively because they're conversation points in decision making. So institutionalization, creating the lens of decision making through this work is, is really important to be successful. But so is building on these existing collaboratives, such as all of you that are in this meeting and that work together regularly, bringing forward real ambition around that collaboration to drive that progress at the regional, but also local scale by bringing all these different stakeholders in. And I believe uh, Nail is gonna talk a little bit about this as well. So I may have stolen a couple of her talking points, but um, we really do need to uh, lift everybody up and particularly in this region, bring the innovation economy to bear and we've already seen this happening in Sacramento, right? And spearhead these case studies for immediate deployment across California and the rest of the country, because people are really hungry for success stories. And I think this region is one of the best to, to be able to pull those together and deploy them. So that, that's uh, kind of my, my, uh, <laughs> my pitch and um, uh, for a successful collaborative effort here and excited about the conversation. Well, thanks so much, Michael, for joining us. And we, we look forward to, uh, you know, continuing the conversation after Nyla goes. So Nyla, you, you should be a co-host and you should be able to, to share slides from your end. Um, Nyla uh, Popardin is Executive Director of Climate Plan. Uh, and I I'm going to ask her to take it away. Go ahead. And you might be on mute. All right. I, there we go. Can you get oh, There we go. All right. Um, so thank you guys for having me. Um, I, let me just start, I'm gonna keep my presentation really short and sweet because as Michael said, we share many similar points. Um, Naila Popardin, Executive Director from Climate Plan. This feels very, uh, you know, homely. I know most of you guys and appreciate working with and collaborating with many of you. So many of these points, I'm sure many of you have heard me make before. Um, so just some, Background on climate plan. Let's see. Um, climate plan is a statewide organization that has about 60 partners that focus. Some are regional based, some are statewide. We even have some national partners that are a part of us. But we all work at the intersection of land use, transportation, air quality, and housing. And we try and do all of that through an equity and justice lens. Um, we know that you can't work on issues in a silo, so you can't have a conversation without air quality, without talking about transportation. You can't talk about transportation without talking about housing. And so we really hold, like work as a convener to facilitate conversations so that we can have really holistic conversations across issue and also across regions. So some of the ways that Climate Plan has been engaging in air quality conversations, but more just GHG reduction, actually, let me just back up for a second and give a little bit more history on Climate Plan. Climate Plan was founded 14 years ago out of, um, after 375 was passed, a bunch of groups got together and said, you know, this is gonna be really hard to track, let's build a coalition. So much of Climate Plan's mission is really around tracking all the different parts of um, SB 375 in ways that SB 375 has morphed and changed in the way that it shows up, so has climate plan. So the way that climate plan is really engaging around GHG emissions um, reduction in now is through scoping plan, 
the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure, which was recently adopted. We engage on California Transportation Commission guideline policies, um, SB 743 implementation, and a few other, uh, and a little bit more around CEQA, general plans, climate action plans, RTP, or regional transportation plans, sustainable community strategies. Um, and this list, let me see which, has us then interacting with all of these different agencies, CARB, CALSTA, Caltrans, CTC, HCD, OPR, ABC, DEFG, right? The alphabet soup here. Um, and we're interacting with these agencies um, regularly. This also means that we're interacting with MPOs and local jurisdictions and local cities and states. And so I think with that, some common themes that we're always lifting up are setting ambitious VMT reduction goals. Sometimes that's setting VMT reduction goals just in general, amplifying community voices and environmental justice voices at all phases of the process. And another thing that um, is really funny, to me it's really funny that it's missing in so many of our planning processes are actually progress reports, accountability and flexibility when plans don't work. We love to write a plan and put it on a shelf and then never actually in a plan talk about when we're gonna check and if we followed it. And so um, a lot of our work is just around making sure that we're setting VMT reduction goals, amplifying the voices and yeah, making sure there's accountability. Some of the questions that we're always asking are, can we reduce our emissions without impacting, without impacting most folks' everyday lives? Because I think we have to start having honest conversations about what the shift in culture is actually going to look like to risk to achieve, you know, zero emissions or net zero. And how do we ensure that people from historically discriminated communities are not being overburdened? And how can we frame emissions reductions as positives? One of the things that we're always trying to do at Climate Plan is not just talk about the particular percentage that we're reducing, but actually talk about like what that means for quality and way of life, especially for folks in um, our disadvantaged communities. Uh, because we can get in these conversations where we're talking about, you know, whether adding bike lanes or investing in a particular amount in bike lanes or reducing freeways will get a per particular percentage of reductions, but so often it's lost in what that actually means for the people who are utilizing and the end user. Um, and so these are some questions that we bring up. So I, let me stop share. So very similar to a lot of what Michael's pieces are, there's such a need for interagency coordination on a lot of this, because as you saw the different agencies that we're working with, and I'm sure many of you guys are as well, having to engage and say the same thing and plans that are um, overlaying each other. And I want to commend folks at CARB and folks at some of the bigger transportation agencies because they're doing a great job and trying to um, at least work together. But we really need to be thinking through like plans that are more holistic and encompassing of all of the different aspects of climate change and GHG reductions. Some other like last things that I'll just call out before I'm going to end my time is, I'm going to make sure I'm looking through my notes. Um, yeah, and also very similar to what Michael said, the regions working together um, and jurisdictions within a particular region, but also having a more regional scope around GHG reductions is something that's largely necessary. So I, most of you guys know me from doing a, a local advocacy, but here I'm wearing my statewide hat. So I prom I'm sorry if I'm not talking region specific enough, but um, I, I truly believe that Sacramento can lead on this. I truly believe that um, we should be, not that even that we can, I think that we should be. Um, and I really think that we can put our heads together to like get this right. And so I'm excited for groups like this convening um, and being able to engage in these conversations. And I'll, I'll just end there. Well, thank you so much for, for that presentation and for breaking it down in, in simple terms for us. Um, you know, I'm, I am admittedly not a climate expert, <laughs> so this is all really, really helpful for me and I think for others who, who just are not in that world. Um, so want to encourage folks to raise their hands uh, if you have questions or points you'd like to elevate for any of the, anyone on this call. Um, I know we had a couple of questions earlier in, in the chat that I'd like to, to, uh, to elevate. One of them is from Dave Johnston at El Dorado County Air, uh, Air Quality Management District. 
And um, he's asking what percentage of worldwide GHG emissions are generated in California. And I think he's speaking to, you know, kind of how much can we do? Even when, even if we're firing on all cylinders, how much can we, can we really do? And I don't know who wants to uh, speak to that. Rajinder. <laughs> we are less than 1% of the global emissions for greenhouse gases. But we are also the world's fifth largest economy as a subnational region. And so I think it's important that the work we do here be something that can be exported because unless other people start to do similar programs or start take similar actions, we're, us getting to zero won't matter if nobody else actually works with us. We'll still feel the impacts of climate change. And I'll actually just add briefly to that. In 2012, I represented California at the uh, United Nations Conference of Parties. And one of the things that was really fascinating to, to those, there were just a couple of us there at the time, but people would come up to us and say, what are you doing in California? Because if you don't do it, nobody else will. And so the, the key of it is, is that people are watching California for progress, for proof of concept, for case studies. And if we succeed, other people will do it. If we don't succeed, it's not likely others will step into that space and take that risk. So we are that tip of the spear, you know, front line, ready to go and, and show proof of concept. And so it's a really important role globally. Ayla, did you want to say anything? All right. Well, let's go to uh, Director Fishman with SMUD. Thank you. Um, a great panel and nice to see a lot of familiar faces. My question is, is frankly very parochial to SMUD because one of the things we struggle with is, you know, we've embarked on a, on a plan to get to carbon zero by 2030. We think we're going to be able to do that. But um, one of the slides uh, that was up earlier today that, and, and I, you know, I, I know this, but I have to be reminded sometimes that, you know, in California, vehicles are about 50% of, of emissions or more, and utilities and energy production is is 5%, give or take. And so when I try to, I guess I'm looking for some help from people, and how do we try to describe that to people when we say, you know what, it it might be okay to have our power plants running a little bit longer than we hope if it means that they're supplying electricity to electric vehicles on large scale and i, I you know th that we might be able to reduce emissions and greenhouse gases far more in that way than than uh than just by cutting our power plants off which people want us to do right away any 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 help any guidance on that at all so I can take a shot at this because there was SB 100, which required the state CARB, CEC and CPUC, the Public Utilities Commission, to look at how to get a zero carbon uh, grid by 2045 for retail sales of electricity. And I can tell you, we're asking a lot of that sector. We're asking that sector to not only decarbonize itself, which means only be renewables or zero carbon, but we also want that sector to see increased load as it pushes into, into the transportation sector and as it pushes into the building sector and potentially some of the easier and simpler industry throughout the state. And so you're looking at load growth, you're pushing on renewables, which means you have to think about what happens when you need reliable power 24 seven and you need to keep civil society and your political folks on the board with what you're trying to do in terms of get away from the other fossil fuels that you have in the system today. And so CARB and CEC, the PUC and CAISO are going to be holding a joint workshop for the scoping plan. And it's gonna to bring together some of the issues that all of the agencies are seeing. One is we probably need to keep those gas fleets around with renewable hydrogen or renewable natural gas and pair it with something like CCS or other options for uh, fuels. And that, and that we cannot just simply shut those plants down. And the other, another piece is that, um, for us to actually implement what we came up with in SB 100, where there would be some retirement of gas plants, we need permitting for transmission build out. The California ISO is uh, fit to be tied these days because they feel like they can't get any transmission build out permitted. And they're working on a 20, 20 year transmission build out plan. They're starting it this year. And it's just gonna talk about the massive investments and land availability and land suitability to actually have all of this infrastructure in place. And there's just a general theme out there that if you can't, that the electricity sector, because there's solar, there's wind, now we've got offshore, wi or offshore wind out there, that with all of these choices, it's just a matter of doing it. But the matter of doing it has to be at such a rate and scale 
that it's not going to meet the expectations and the needs that we need the sector to deliver for across the economy to get to the statewide targets. And so we are working through that process in the scoping plan. We're going to socialize some of those issues in that, in that side. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to Dr. Ayala. Thanks, Adrian, for the formality. Um, I got a question for, for Naila. And um, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for everything you've done um, now and in the past. You've been such a particular important player in the Mayor's Climate Commission and some of the other activities uh, that we are trying to improve upon uh, in the Sacramento Area District Region with respect to being more community center. So I really want to use this unique opportunity uh, because we have you all three presenters here today to, to raise an issue. And I don't mean to be provocative by any means, but I do think that some of these topics deserve an honest, uh, if controversial discussion. Um, I don't know if you heard my question to Rajinder earlier uh, about uh, some of the EJ community's perspectives on the policies that the state is, is uh, promoting. Um, but I wanna pose the same question to you in terms of your local work and your current work with climate plan, because I love the last, uh, the very last bullet of, of your second slide where, where you're basically saying anything that we do, we should be looking at ways to support the communities. And with that lens in mind, would you agree that um, some of the perspectives that the um, local communities have are philosophical differences between the way that uh, uh, the state wants to proceed? I mean, at the end of the day, they are still differences, right? So is climate plan going to have uh, a better suggested strategy for how to support our communities? Okay, that's a spicy. What, what was the word you used? Uh, uh, tough conversation. Yeah, when, um, Re when Rajinder said that I wrote down philosophical disagreements mm -hmm. um, because that, that stung a little bit. Um, because while that is true, I think the philosophy that the way, th I think using equity projects being funded in ways that are in nature inequitable perpetuate the problem. And I think that's where a lot of the communities are coming from um, is, you know, folks are, we understand cap and trade. In terms of what all alternatives, I think that answer we don't have today, but we're very curious in exploring it and looking at it. I mean, we're having the same conversation when we talk about like road pricing as we go to an all electric, like how are we gonna make sure that communities that are displaced aren't paying more in VMT fees to travel? More? Like, so those are conversations that we need to have. And I think at the root of it is we have to really like dramatically rethink our funding structures because they're flawed. Um, so no, there isn't an answer today, but I think like you said, like we have to engage in these tough conversations. And I think too, the other thing that I wrote down too is, I don't know what she said, but my note was what the legislature, just because the legislature is doing it is not necessarily a barometer for what is right. And I think um, what we're doing is these incremental changes and we're just adding on and tacking on new funding programs to fund, you know, um, to change some of, you know, we're adding on new funding to just add on good stuff, but we're not really getting to the root of, we're spending on a lot of bad stuff still, and we need to shift that. And we have to engage in a lot of these tough conversations to be able to figure out what that looks like. And I think um, with the scoping plan, I think with the electrification um, executive order, we have an opportunity to really kind of dig into those conversations. And I really think that like, we can't be dismissive of EJ voices, and we really need to like listen to what those priorities are. And we need to start with like, what are the needs in EJ communities? And then work funding out around that. So I'm gonna jump in because I think there was a mischaracterization of what I responded to. The question that I had was about the cap and trade program. That is one program of dozens and many dozens that we run at the state level. And so my, my response about philosophical differences is purely in the context of the cap and trade program. When it comes to many of the other issues and concerns and options and things that are being raised by the EJ advocates, we are in alignment. When we think about phasing out fossil combustion in the transportation sector, not only is that part of the ZEV executive order by the governor, but it is also a priority at CARB when it comes to meeting our SIP requirements for air quality. 
And so I want to make sure that there is no misunderstanding about CARB's position about EGA voices. They are important. They are integral to the process of the scoping plan. I was asked about one program and only one program. And when I talked about the legislature, that again was about one program. And CARB and none of the agencies can unilaterally decide to do something unless we have the authority and the resources that are appropriated through the legislative process. And so again, on the one program, it was debated on a carbon pricing program between a carbon tax and cap and trade. Both times the legislature chose uh, cap and trade and both times they appropriated resources to run that program. Um, but there are many, many other programs at CARB and other, other state agencies that are very, very much centered and directly centered on feedback that we get from the EJ advocates that fit into the authority that we have from the legislature. Thank you for that. Michael, do you have anything to, to add? All right, thumbs up. Let's go to Susan Hari. Um, hi, Adrian, thanks. Uh, this question is for Rajinder and Michael McCormick. Um, you know, trying to uh, get more collaboration across regional areas wouldn't, and for greater consistency of data and goals, do you think it makes sense for the state to do actually conduct the greenhouse gas inventories in lieu of each jurisdiction conducting those inventories? And on the backside or, or even before the uh, climate action plan is approved, um, what do you think of the idea of maybe uh, the state somehow establishing an oversight program of of the jurisdiction's caps. The oversight could be done by the MPOs with their transportation data, the air districts, and maybe Caltrans, and perhaps others. So two questions, one about the inventory, and then just one about a, a consistent set of oversight on climate action plans. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I'm happy to jump in. I, you know, um, there's a, a link on the last slide of my presentation to uh, a document a group of climate practitioners put together. Um, it's on my website too, fairlawnstrategies.com. And this, we collectively worked for about a year and a half to try to try to think through what's wrong with climate action planning right now nationally. Why can't we make more progress at the local level? And, you know, I brought up planning, perpetual planning paralysis and in, in my points. And um, yes, absolutely. I think it would, would make a lot of sense for the state to help support consistent greenhouse gas inventories across every jurisdiction in the state and provide that. My first climate action plan that I started writing in 2007, you know, we were struggling with access to data how to pull it together in a reasonable way and how to put it together in a way that actually policy could respond to. And we have much more sophisticated ways of pulling that data together now and displaying it, but there's still so many of the same issues with inconsistencies across jurisdictions, how that data is treated, analyzed and produced to be able to inform the policy development process. If you could start from that point, from a consistent standpoint, that would be really powerful. One of the things we talked about a couple of years ago in the last, um, in some of the deliberations around the last scoping plan was, gosh, wouldn't it be helpful to see how local governments were contributing to the statewide emissions reductions? And if we could see that local governments had particular policies that were making real progress, let's fund those and get them going as quickly as we can, because that just adds to that portfolio of successful programs statewide. Um, so that, so, so that, that's a, you know, long answer <laughs> is absolutely, I think that's a really important point. Um, and then I, I apologize, I, uh, I missed that second question. About oversight, uh, say the COGS or the uh, air districts uh, or Caltrans or others. So that well, there's, there's uh, oversight. Consist yeah. Consist yeah, I mean, the, cons there's oversight and there's technical assistance, right? There's, so the housing element is really housing element safety elements or housing elements and local housing mitigation plans are probably the two of the primary documents and local coastal plans that have oversight from the state. 
And um, w- there's been a lot of talk about how helpful it would be for local governments to have climate action planning oversight. But I think what we found is that there's good case studies out there where, for example, the Bay Area, AQMD, Sacramento Air District, um, uh, in some cases, OPR, when they have the capacity, has been able to support good document delivery uh, because they have the capacity, they have programs to help support that work. I think what we run into is when there isn't that technical assistance and resources to help support really good product delivery, um, then we, you know, we tend to go to the least cost option. Um, and those least cost options are not likely to be set up in a way that are going to show successful policy implementation. So I, I'm kind of skipping around the question because I don't know if oversight is the answer, but certainly resources and capacity to, to make sure people can do a really good job on those plans is very helpful. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chris, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, hi, everybody. This is Chris Norm. I'm with the uh, North State Building Industry Association. So we're the builders in, in this region um, on the executive committee. And I was just kind of struck by some of the conversations about the climate action plans, because we're actually dealing with that at Sac County right now, looking at what our mitigation options are when we place new housing. And one of them, the primary thing that it mentions is the is carbon farming and the offsets for that. And um, I'm interested if the state has a perspective on, on the way to do that effectively. I think that's, it seems like a very cost-effective way to do it, um, but there's been a lack of detail of how we would actually affect that and how we could work with local jurisdictions or to, to actually do this. And we're very interested in, in some of those, you know, I, I use least cost options where, you know, like more effective ways of doing this. So, you know, is there a way that is recommended to do carbon farming and uh, getting credits uh, in, in a productive way in, in California? So I can start on that one, you know, for the state level programs, we do have a compliance offset program. It was authorized under AB 32. It was slightly amended in AB 398 in 2017. And so we were sued on the program that it didn't deliver real additional permanent quantifiable verifiable offset credits. We prevailed in that lawsuit. And so we've been running that program for the last 10, 11 years at the state level. Um, we know that some of the caps have been sued when they've tried to include offsets in their um, climate action plans, or they've tried to include uh, offsets in some of the sequel mitigation for some of the developments, et cetera. And we think there is a way that um, you can have sequel mitigation or greenhouse gas mitigation that is cost effective, that actually brings benefits within the regions where those projects are located that can be credible and verifiable and and real reductions to help um, address the the compensation you're looking for. There's been efforts at some of the voluntary offset registries to develop methodologies that can be used at the local level for CEQA mitigation or climate action plans. I think what happens is that there's such a adverse reaction to the concept of offsets because of some really lingering bad um, offset actors in the international world going back decades that anytime the word offset is used, it's seen as a dirty word. Um, And so, you know, we've gone back to the traditional phrasing of GHG mitigation, and we've been talking to some of the the larger cities and counties about how to structure um, actions that would protect and preserve uh, natural working lands or other space um, that brings biodiversity, recreational, other benefits to the community. Um, but also is able to quantify real reductions and real um, benefits from a, G, from a GHG perspective. So there is an opportunity there. I think it's really just how do you how do you rely on a standard that that can be acceptable to most of the, the society and most of the stakeholders that get involved in the conversation. Um, but I think it should never be seen as the primary way to get out of actually reducing emissions from the fossil and industry side. So it can complement anything you can't directly reduce. And I think just to add on to that, you know, we've got this loading order of um, mitigation where it's on site, then off site, you know, on site to extend feasible, off site to extend feasible, and then you move to offsets. The um, I think the the point about regional collaboration that could potentially impact this discussion is there's urban areas that are needing to offset urban emissions. And there is agricultural and open space areas that have the, the ability to potentially sequester emissions through change behavior, different types of uh, land management strategies. So 
cities and counties working together could potentially develop measures that benefit both of them to achieve those, uh, those objectives around mitigating impacts in one space uh, and benefiting uh, others in another. It's not that different from offsite mitigation for wildlife restoration or, or something similar to like that, which is set in case law across uh, kind of the CEQA landscape. Um, but it's, 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 there are pilot studies that are happening right now. Um, and I know that the, um, the state agricultural lands conservation program through the Strategic Growth Council uh, is uh, looking at this. So it's something that you might want to take a look at. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an area of opportunity to explore. Not that I know that I don't actually know of any specific case studies off the top of my head. Um, but, uh, but agricultural and open space is, a, is an opportunity for uh, connecting back to the urban landscape that we need to uh, think about a lot more actively. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, so one more thing. So I actually had a question, and I think it speaks to a bit of the tension uh, between the, the urgency of climate action and then the need to actually meaningfully engage community members in the process. And I think, you know, Nyla, Nyla talked about the importance of centering equity. And Michael said, well, hey, there's stuff we can do right now, even like outside of the climate action plan process that would have a lot of impact. And so this is kind of for all three of you, but how do we square the two? How do we balance the meaningful community engagement with, with, with taking action urgently? I, I think we've been doing that to some extent already. And I'll give you an example. One is ever since the very first scoping plan, we've talked about zero emission vehicles as being important. Every scoping plan has had that. So it's not like we've changed our, our approach or changed our uh, decision on what needs to happen for fossil combustion in light duty vehicles. And what we've seen is that over time, uh, we've gotten funding programs, et cetera. And as we've gotten funding programs, we've had community engagement to say, how do we make sure that this zero emission vehicles are accessible to low income households and that there is the ability to think about multifamily housing for charging infrastructure and also for single, single family housing for infrastructure. And so I think on some of the places where Michael is thinking in terms of, you know, things we know, least regret policies, I think there has been a track record and there is clear indications of what the, what the preferences are from EJ advocates in terms of where to put that money first or those resources first, how to give access first to those communities. Um, and so I think that exists. I think what's been happening is when you think about the funding resources, and I'm obviously talking at the state level because I represent CARB, what we see is that you have a limited amount of funding. And in order to get some of those funding plans across the finish line, you have to start carving out different pieces for different needs. And what really is needed is a focused amount of funding, a sustainable committed amount of funding year over year that is dedicated to some of these specific purposes to really make a transformational difference in what you're trying to achieve. And I heard the word incremental changes thrown out. And I agree, there's been some incremental changes on things that we already know we need to do, should do, and we know where some of the equity pieces lie and the EJ advocates um, have weighed in. But it comes back to, can we just commit the resources to make that transformational change instead of diluting that funding through different little programs here and there for other purposes? Gotcha. Yeah, and I'll hop in and just say, I, I mean, there are a lot, there's a lot of movement happening. One of the things that I say around um, often, and it's not necessarily climate related, but, um, oh, and we're a local group, so I can use this. I'm used to talking to statewide folks. Um, my neighborhood should not have to engage more than Land Park does on decisions. No one asks folks in Land Park how often they need trash picked up, right? Um, the trash gets picked up. But then po folks want to come to my neighborhood and say, well, we want to do a listening session to talk to you about whether or not you want us to pick up trash. No, there are like big infrastructure things that can be happening now that can be set up to set communities in place. Um, and then we can engage communities. If, if we're talking about like EV vehicles, right? We can start building infrastructure and putting that in place. And then we can have conversations about like the car buying programs that will come. And we can do thorough community engagement. But there are things that we can be doing immediately um, to build infrastructure for these conversations. Because the other thing that'll happen is you engage communities and then you have to then go build the infrastructure and then you have to go apply what they said 
So it really shows a sense of urgency if we're already building the, the infrastructure and then come back, engage the communities around the details. Yeah, and I just to kind of echo comments. Um, we, there, there is the low hanging fruit that we can implement really quickly, um, but there's also a history of leaving out marginalized voices in a very fast implementation. So taking a quick pause to say, look, you know, do we have the right voices at the table? Uh, making sure that you're bringing in a, a community group to keep you honest as you're moving forward quickly on initiatives is really important. And I think one of the biggest issues I deal with in, in folks that I work with in building regional collaboratives is trust that needs to be amended because prior decisions maybe did not include those voices that were really important to a successful implementation. Trust building is not something that happens in a week, <laughs> right? It's something that takes time. So creating a structure in place, a long-term commitment to organizations and trust building so that you can work on implementation together. It's where that regional construct comes in really handy because it can't just be an ad hoc regional construct to do one project. It really has to be a sustaining initiative that brings voices in, builds that trust and creates a long-term commitment to regional progress. And like I said, I, I think Sacramento is perfect for that. There's so many examples of where that's worked well, but stitching that together into a broader uh, region-wide initiative that can really show progress and scale initiatives is really important. And I, I think this region is right there, ready to go. Well, thank you for that, Michael. I think we have so many of the, the right folks in the room to have that conversation. Of course, others are needed too. Um, I wanna next go to that. me. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, as, as you know, we um, at, at, at SMUD, we've um, committed to reaching 2030 um, zero emissions. But, um, and, but alongside that, we've, we've determined that we're not going to do this in a way that leaves um, disadvantaged communities behind. And, and actually, the way I look at it, we need to not just not leave people behind, but Let's focus on making investments that are the, the in communities that have, have had a lack of investment in them. And so let's figure out, uh, so let's not just be asking people, hey, what do you want? Let's like, what really makes sense for helping these communities? Where, where should we focus our attention and resources in helping folks uh, not really, um, benefiting from the investments that we need to make to achieve our, our zero carbon goals. So, you know, focusing on electrification of buildings and transportation in communities that need more help than others. So, you know, historically, a lot of help has gone to uh, more affluent communities and more, more tuned in, more financially available to take advantage of how assistance is structured. And I'm very interested in making sure that we don't do it that way anymore, that we start paying, you know, let, let's focus our attention. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's some really good examples of, you know, let, let's figure out how to, to get uh, poorer communities better access to, to electric vehicles, whether it's Risha, whatever the model is, let's figure out how to make that work. And then, um, and then also as we're pushing for electrification, and I'm a, I'm a true believer on the need to, to electrify transportation and buildings, but we really need to pay attention to how is this gonna affect people who uh, you know, um, have lesser means that, okay, to, to make the transition from gas to electric, you know, so like if you have, I've gotten pushback. I, I you know, and I, I see it as pushback, but I also see it as, oh, let's identify what the barriers are that we need to overcome and figure out how to overcome those. So people in more modest means, you know, you don't want to put in an ordinance that says, okay, if your if your water heater goes out, you got to electrify everything, right? You've got to put in a brand new circuit, which might mean that you've got to put in a, in a brand new. Um, um, panel and then all of a sudden you can't have hot water because you can't afford the four thousand dollars it takes to replace 
a, a water heater that maybe ought to be five hundred dollars. So how do we how do we overcome that? How do we help those communities make that transition? Because a lot of parts of our community they don't want to make the the expense. It's you know it's a, it's an expensive thing, but some people absolutely cannot do that. You know, it's not even a choice. They they can't do it. So how do we make sure that as we electrify, we don't impose hurdles on people that they're they're not able to overcome? Maybe somebody might lose uh, lose their home, or they just don't have hot water, or whatever whatever that impact is going to be. And I think, um, and you know, that's not a smug decision, but those are things that we need to work with the cities and the county to figure out if we're going to meet these very ambitious electrification goals. How do we do that in a way that doesn't actually hurt people along the way and, and hurting people that can, can least absorb the impact of that? And I don't know the answers. And, you know, I, it, those are things that need to be addressed, <clears throat> but I think we need to make sure we, we pay attention to that, that type of impact. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if our, our speakers have any, I, I know we're, we're getting close to our time. Uh, if you guys have any just final comments kind of on the, this, this unique intersection of, of climate and air quality and, and how you know, all of us, local governments, community members, industry folks uh, can, you know, what are your recommended next steps for all of us in, in making sure that this is a more regional conversation? So I can go first. Um, I think it's very important for local governments and regional approaches to um, be in the space for both climate and for air quality. There are different jurisdictions in terms of authority that are reserved for local governments relative to state. Um, but then many statutes charge the state with things like SB 375, which is transportation planning, which are not enforceable by us and we aren't the ultimate decision makers and that collaboration and coordination between the decision makers at the local level and what the statutes are requiring and the agencies are putting forth needs to actually be very aligned and implemented to actually realize both the local air emission reductions that we need to see and the greenhouse gas emission reductions that we need to see. So I think that there is a, a very close relationship that needs to work there. Um, and I think that there is a lot of frustration um, among communities that have been marginalized, redlined, and are are located next to sources. And I think that again comes to, you know, what authorities reside at what levels of government? How do we work collaboratively to make sure that we're doing policies and plans that can reduce that cumulative exposure uh, for harmful air pollution? You know, at CARB, we are primarily mobile sources and we have the ZEV executive order, we have funding, but we need all of those, the infrastructure and we need, um, the permitting to actually go through to make sure that those reductions are realized and the benefits for climate and for air quality reduction are actually realized out there. Um, and then I think again on the AB 617, which gives CARB some new authority to actually work directly in communities in collaboration with the districts and other local government agencies, that has to be maximized to actually engage the communities in terms of priorities, especially where they feel like they haven't had a voice or had a seat at the table. And this gives them an important process and an important place to have a seat at the table. And I think that all of the government agencies that are included in those conversations, no matter what level, um, should be listening and then thinking about how to work collaboratively to meet the needs that are being articulated in those meetings. Well, I'll let Nyla have the, the last word. Um, you know, I, I really quickly, I think that um, the key right now, because there are so many resources, but there's also a lot of different needs and a lot of different perspectives on how those resources should be spent. We saw this through the legislative session this year, uh, right? A massive surplus that was, that was fought desperately over. I would say the, the, the first thing to do is when you see a funding opportunity, is to take a pause and say, who can your partners be at the regional scale? Who are the existing collaboratives, the existing organizations working across the region that you can help activate to bring partners in? Instead of competing with each other, let's make these initiatives regional. And that makes them much more powerful, much more impactful, and much more significant from a scaling standpoint. So I think that would be the one thing that I would leave you with is this is a unique history in time, a once in a generation opportunity from a funding standpoint from state, and what's hopefully coming from the federal government, let's not waste that on competing with each other. 
I um, 100% agree with that. And I'm just going to push it just one step further. I think that when folks signed on and we did the introductions and we saw where everyone came from, there's no reason why folks on this, on this, in this meeting can't solve this. I mean, we literally have all the right people in the room. And so I think we have to go from doing nice luncheon presentations to like the next one, we're all rolling up our sleeves and actually talking about, not just talking about the stuff, but figuring out what our piece of the pie is and start cutting that pie up um, because it's here. It's literally here on this call where we could be moving a lot of stuff and really like moving things. And I think that's where Valley Vision's leadership is really important in the region. And I think especially that piece where we can bring in some more of the more CBOs that are on the ground doing work in communities, engaging, like there's so much potential and opportunity just on like this meeting alone. Well, thanks, Nyla. All this talk about pie has me getting very hungry. So I, I'd like to close us out um, at 129. <laughs> so um, thank you all again for making time today. I just wanted to give a shout out to Valley Vision's Brittany Johnson. Thank you for holding it down uh, and moving slides uh, forward and making sure everything went, went well. Um, thanks to our fantastic lineup of speakers and to the Cleaner Air Partnership's generous contributors for sponsoring the luncheon. I have one last little poll that, again, you know how I love polls. So uh, I just wanna uh, launch this real quick and see what you all think. It's climate related, I promise. It's, are we gonna see another 100 degree day in 2021? So take just 10 seconds uh, and then I'm gonna end the poll and share it with you all. All right, three, two, one. Okay, a lot of folks saying we are going to have a 100 degree day here in Sacramento. So again, uh, we'll see about that. I'm not so sure, but thank you for, for, uh, for taking the poll. Um, so we've heard a lot about different CAPs, the Cleaner Air Partnership, the Climate Action Plans, CAP and Trade. Um, there is one more that I'd like to share, which is CAP 2 CAP. Um, it's the Sacramento Metro Chamber's uh, annual uh, federal advocacy program that they do every year. Um, the Cleaner Air Partnership, us, we actually manage the air quality team for that um, annual program. And so I, I would like to invite all of you on the call to join us in federal advocacy uh, the week of October 25th, next month. Um, we'll be focusing on wildfire and forest management as well as um, uh, mobility and electrification as our two big issue areas. So again, that's in the chat. Um, I also wanted to plug a really cool event that has maybe some folks on the call are involved in, but it's Climate Justice Festival happening here in Oak Park on Saturday, September 25th. Um, it's from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, at McClatchy Park. It's gonna be a great time. I know I'll be out there tabling for our air monitoring project um, and would love to see some folks. So, so please uh, stop by. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I'm gonna share a link in the chat to our evaluation form. So this is how you can help us improve uh, continually for future luncheons. You can also suggest topics for future luncheons here. And so again, um, you know, we'll take all your feedback into account um, so that when we come together next, we can have a conversation that reflects the, the wants and needs of, of the group here. So click that evaluation form before the meeting closes so, so you have access to it. I will send it out again via email. Um, and then just lastly, you know, we, we will have a recording of this up uh, early next week on our YouTube channel, and we'll send you all a link to that, as well as all the presentations from today. So thank you again. Happy Friday, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye, everybody. <clears throat>